Hello, everyone, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST team. My name is Matt Graybaugh. I'm a science coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Science Applications Program over here in Tucson, Arizona, and I'm one of the federal co-directors of CCAST. CCAST is intended to support landscape scale conservation and restoration by enhancing issue-based peer-to-peer knowledge exchange through things like today's webinar and the development of case studies and hosting workshops. We use these discussions and case studies as foundations for communities of practice uh, around our current focus areas, which include introduced aquatic species, grassland restoration, and adaptation to drought and climate change. If this is new information for you and you'd like to learn more about CCAST, uh, please feel free to reach out to me or Christy directly, and we'll make sure that our email addresses get in the chat. With that, I will turn my video off and hand it over to Christy uh, for the introductions. Well, thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. I'm Christy Miner. I work with the CCAST team at the University of Arizona based in Tucson. I joined CCAST in March as the new coordinator of the non-native aquatic species community of practice. Today, we're hosting a presentation from Dean Hendrickson and Adam Cohen, who will discuss the Fishes of Texas project. Dean is an ichthyologist and conservation biologist with nearly four decades of conservation related research in aquatic ecosystems. Much of his recent efforts have been devoted to the compilation and public provision of the Fishes of Texas online database. Adam is the ichthyology collection manager of the University of Texas's fish collection and has been working in the collections for the last two decades. And for most of that time, he's also worked on the Fishes of Texas project. So just as a reminder, before I turn it over to our presenters, if you have questions during the presentation, please just enter them in the chat box um, and I'll relay them to our speakers after the presentation or I'll ask you to unmute and ask them. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Dean. All right, thank you, Christy. Um, starting out with our title slide here, uh, basically I'm gonna point out first the uh, authorship and the color coordination with the uh, different logos, right? So you'll see that a little bit more here. And uh, basically it's a, a very solid partnership now, been going for a long time and uh, I'll jump right in here. Uh, so we're all about fish collections here at UT, at least the authors here work in the fish collection. I'm gonna say a little bit about the fish collection first um, and, and the value of specimens, but let me, uh, I guess first tell you exactly where we are. We're in Austin, center of Texas, basically right here. We live in this building. This is where the fish collection over here is housed, right next to library storage, from whom we scrounged our, our shelving, basically. We're actually eight miles north of the main campus up here at the Pickle Research Campus. But this, uh, we'd like to talk about this collection as being essentially a library, just like our neighbors. Uh, you can think about the specimens as being books, or the, the jars as being books, and they're, we say they're written in languages we're still learning, which is true. We just learned about DNA, right? These things have DNA. So we're still learning how to read our books. And uh, just like a library, we have a detailed inventory of everything we have, who produced the specimens, when, where, et cetera, and we loan them out to uh, visitors as well. I'm not gonna read our uh, logo up here, but we're part of the Biodiversity Center. And that is our logo, you can see that. And then, um, the rest of the, the gang and the partnership is from Texas Parks and Wildlife. They're scattered around Central Texas generally. I think they get out in the field a little bit more than us. And this is their logo there in green. Um, I'm gonna jump forward and show you, uh, oh, I keep forgetting, this is our uh, behind the scenes partner. They're not actually an author, but we owe an awful lot to the Texas Advanced Computing Center here at UT. They're also on the Pickle campus with us. They're convenient. They uh, provide all the geekiness we need. We as biologists don't do that stuff, uh, but they've helped us get all this stuff done. And in particular, probably the single biggest thing they've done is help us link to the National Hydrography data set. You'll see a lot more about that down here. Thomas Law Urban is the guy that does most of this and we wouldn't be here talking today if it wasn't for him. So I wanted to get him in. Okay, back to that color coordination. So uh, Gary and I, for example, were in our doctoral programs in 1978 when there was the first meeting international meeting on conserva conservation biology. That's what we're really all about. And they defined that discipline as bridging the gap between ecological and evolutionary theory, uh, and then, and conservation policy and practice. 
So really that's what UT does. UT leads the field. We're number six in the country when it comes to specifically ecological and evolutionary theory with our graduate programs. TPWD is all about policy and practice. And then they went into more detail and sound science, bingo, there's UT, protection and perpetuation of natural communities and ecosystems. That's clearly UT's bailiwick, uh, defensible and ideally verifiable. That has specimens written all over it and verification via the data behind the specimen. We make all this openly accessible on the World Wide Web, and we make it uh, about information over community composition over time by aggregating collections well beyond ours. We have a lot of data from other collections. Uh, going further back in the history, Clark Hubbs came to UT in 1950 and started collecting specimens like crazy. Uh, he started the UT fish collection, which I later uh, inherited. By the 80s, he was working on a book with two doctoral students, now both of them members of the Fishers of Texas uh, project. Uh, I replaced him in 1990 and I got into digitization. Our database then was analog. They had started digitizing it before I came on board. I got it done and we were one of the first collections in the world to get their entire specimen database on what was then known as Gopher, but it became later the internet. So then after a while, the idea, uh, came together that really rather than a static book that would get outdated very quickly, why not turn it into an online living, growing and improving book-like specimen-based data-driven website? So that's what we're talking about now. We did that early on. This wasn't really so data-driven. We did have very basic uh, data queries, but this was hand-coded basically by me way back when. And uh, really all it did was start opening the doors to funding. We got Texas Commission for Environmental Quality to uh, fund some of the initial work. And then we really got serious, fast forward many years, and I was talking about many collections, 42 of them to be specific. You can see the details about how many specimens, how many species, all that is there. But the important thing right now is look at the distribution over time. Collecting kind of peaked in the 1970s, the Endangered Species Act came on and whatnot and started tailing off. Uh, but we have a good solid baseline. It goes way back to the 1850s specimens at the Smithsonian and whatnot back there. Um, so we pulled all that data together. We spent a ton of time cleaning it up, making it mappable like this. And I wanted to show this early map just because it kind of surprised us. We kind of expected a little bit more, but you think about it, Texas is 98% private. You can't go hardly anywhere without getting landowner permission. Virtually all collecting is done at public road crossings. It's very arid out here, especially in the West, lots of rain in the East, but very dry out here. So not a lot of habitat for fishes. Um, nor much road access through all those uh, undeveloped areas. And then we also knew that there were a lot of collecting that had been done, but hadn't made it into collection. So we didn't have those data. They hadn't been shared with anybody, basically. So we got busy and uh, started cleaning up this stuff. It wasn't too surprising that all of the variations on genus species combinations that came in from the donors was messy. We cleaned it up and we about have the total number of unique genus and species combinations. But then the georeferencing took a long time, but it was extremely valuable because now it allowed us to start mapping this stuff and looking for outlier records. So uh, it was noteworthy that almost 5% of the things we flagged as outliers in one sense or another turned out to be misidentified, um, or 70% of those that we flagged turned out to be disidentified. So you know we could clean this up. We have specimens. We can go back. We can check those identifications. And then we still knew that beyond that, uh, Maybe another issue is that there are sympatric species that look quite a lot alike and are probably confused too. We checked a few of those. This is just one example, 5% misidentification with at least this one example. So thank God there's specimens. We can start cleaning this stuff up by looking at them. So here's the distribution of where our data come from, at least the North American part. We do have some records from Europe, from Texas, uh, but uh, we went around, we got funding from TPWD to do this. It was extremely valuable. We went back to all these old specimens collected in all these different museums. We didn't actually hit them all. We got loans from a lot of them, but uh, we were able to check those identifications and clean up the data. So this was really rewarding. Once we got back and we started compiling all this stuff, you see here on the maps, our initial, or the screen here, this is our, on the left is our initial mapping. You can see that the georeferencing we got in was very messy. Basically we decided to just blow it off and start over. So we did all that and we did the taxonomy work. Things are starting to look better here. We have these outliers. We did all that uh, museum travel. We cleaned up the outliers, all the taxonomy. And now we have pretty solid maps. And what we were headed for with these cleaned up data 
was species distribution models. We wanted to do those for a number of reasons. It was kind of the hot thing back then. But basically, um, I'll talk a little bit more about them here soon. But as we sorted through this, it was clear how little we knew about the, the fish fauna to begin with before Fishes of Texas Project came along, because we found on average 2.36 new species that were previously known from each of the major river basins. So that's pretty significant when you think about that. That's a big chunk of the fauna that we didn't even know existed in those basins. Um, I'm going to skip over this real quick. This is a, out of our QA site. The gray shaded areas are what we determined to be native ranges. We found that our assessment of native ranges differed from uh, many previous authorities. We did this as kind of an expert opinion approach using our data, but Adam will talk more about that later. Uh, basically, we started working more on cleaning the data. We had several different projects. This on the left is a, a noteworthy one. This is an endangered species that was being considered for reassessment of the endangered status. And when we went to the Smithsonian, we found these old specimens that had been previously misidentified as something else. We determined they were no Tropus oxyrhynchus. Prior to that, the standard understanding was that the species was introduced here in the Colorado River. This wasn't part of its native range. We very unambiguously looked at all the specimens and determined that they were in fact endemic to that, uh, or that was, this was part of their native range. And so they had lost half of their native range in this one major river basin over the years. So that changed the, the nature of the assessment. Over here, we found some interesting things. Uh, this species also, we found that all of the species identified as weed shiner in the Brazos were in fact misidentified. We still have no valid uh, specimens of weed shiner in the Brazos. So this gap here is real. Uh, you look at all the field guides, everything, they extend the weed shiner distribution all across here. So we're cleaning up the data really quite nicely. And then the other thing we can do is start exploring changes over time. Here's a, one of our early maps of the total distribution over all time of the pallid shiner. I'm gonna jump forward now and focus on the 76 to 2015 ones. There was background sampling going on outside of the yellow, but they weren't showing up. Similarly here, background sampling, they weren't showing up and they were restricted further down to this area. So this wasn't on anybody's radar, but we pointed it out. And so you know people can go out and check on it now. And in fact, we found range reduction trends for all of these different species. So uh, for the first time, we were able to really unambiguously demonstrate these with data. And we looked a little bit further into trends. We kind of tried to get at abundance, realized this is presence only data we're working with. So it's a little bit hard to get at abundance, but we can look at catch per unit effort. We know the general sampling background effort, in other words, collecting events by all collectors over time. And we can look at the proportion of those in which these target species turned up. So this is that same endangered species. It is in fact declining over time. And this is another one native to Texas, but introduced outside of the Rio Grande Basin and expanding and becoming much more abundant. We knew that basically. So these kind of substantiated this. This is still a work in progress. All these graphs for all the species are available, but we're gonna run this batch analysis on our new data set pretty soon. And we'll tweak the algorithm when we do that. So we'll have better results, but it's useful stuff. And getting back to the SDMs now, I mentioned those, we have these uh, uh, models on our website, so you can download them from just about all of our species. And uh, we wanted to do them because we had in mind doing something like this, using conservation network planning programs to come up with sort of a, where do you get the biggest bang for the buck if you invest your money in trying to uh, recovering or saving, preserving native fish communities. Well, the models, when we concatenated them all, piled them all together, told them these shaded areas were where we could best do that. This project has now taken on a life of its own, more or less. Uh, these areas resulted in formations of local groups of stakeholders that now get together and meet regularly to talk about how they might best pool all their resources to, in a coordinated way, help uh, manage these native fish communities and, and restore them, so restore the watersheds. So it's a nice watershed based, uh, based approach to this. A lot of people are skeptical about models and we were when we first started too. We wanted to, a little bit more proof. We knew how the models worked, but we came up with some ideas on how to pragmatically test this. This was our very first one. We went out to the James River Basin, which we had no collection records from at all, but it had been mentioned to be a relatively pristine basin. It's quite uh, you know, off the beaten path. We went out, the models told us that there's a 50% probability of collecting these species 
and a 50% probability that we wouldn't find these species. And as you can see, when we went out and we did it, we actually collected all these that are highlighted red. And so basically it's just telling us the model was right, right? There were a few outliers, but basically these are just, you know, coin tosses. The model tells us there's a less than 50, 50% 50 chance of getting this. So you, you expect a little bit of noise, but basically we demonstrated the model worked there. We did it in another case with Barton Creek. That's a creek that flows into central Texas, right in the middle of Austin through Barton Springs, very famous place. We did all the models. This is the 50% break for the models here, this shaded gray part. So everything above that is higher than 50% probability that those species would show up according to the models. This is the historic data uh, going way back when as to what was in that watershed. We did a 1993 uh, survey before Fishes of Texas actually started. The green is what we found. And then we repeated it in 2008 after all the, the modeling stuff, this is what we found. So you can see again that the models basically are working in a pragmatic sense. We've proven it to ourselves. We also use the models to tell us where we might find new records. This is a tiny little fish that goes through most everybody's sayings. And it's mostly distributed across the Gulf Coast. One record was all we had before from Texas, but the models say there's a pretty good probability it's further west in Texas. So we went out and looked and sure enough, we now know we found it in the Natchez, the Natchez Trinity and the San Jacinto River basins out here. So again, these models are working. I'm glossing over this stuff again here, this is our, our data interface and our website. Adam's gonna talk more about that. Same with this, he'll go over all that stuff and uh, he'll go over native ranges uh, and also this suspect system. We have this nice system of marking our, indicating our confidence and he'll go over that, but you'll see more maps as I go through with these red, yellow, green, and blue dots. Green is what we've looked at, red is suspect stuff. Anyways, like I say, Adam will cover more of that. We use it in our checklist too. Again, Adam's gonna go over that. So I'm gonna jump into some of our new stuff. This is not yet in our public website. We have a test website up. You can see how much data we've added in our previous two tracks of data. We manage these batches of data. And this is gonna increase what we have on the web now sevenfold. Lots of new data coming in and we're experimenting with citizen science, non-specimen based stuff. And this is important because if you don't have a specimen with our process of using just specimen based data, there are some things that we know are not showing up in our data set, right? The Rio Grande sturgeon is one. There were no specimens for that, right? Rio Grande cutthroat's another one. We actually created records to make sure those would show up on our database. Here's that time series again. This is about half and half specimen and non-specimen based occurrences. So half of these gray areas are um, jumping on me again. Half of these gray areas are specimen based and the rest are non-specimen based. So uh, we're just playing with this now. We're working it in our website. It seems to be working pretty well. And right away, it's not surprising we start seeing these outliers. Where in the world are they finding this, right? How's this, where's this coming from? It's coming from FishBrain. If you're not an angler, you may not have heard about it. It's a very popular app for anglers. It allows people to go out and while they're fishing, post their catch and say what they caught. So this guy came along and said that he caught a, uh, a Guadalupe bass. Well, it's way far from its native range. You can see that shaded here. And uh, this is nice because we can link out to this data. These data, we don't have to manage ourselves. They function now in our website, just like our own data. And you can click right into the fish brain site and see what you're seeing right here. So maybe someday we could just shoot off a quick note to Steve and say, hey, you know, we think it's a spot, uh, Guadalupe bass, you know, check out Fishes of Texas. Um, but this angler database data stuff is really potentially very valuable. Uh, we found a lot of good stuff in it. And uh, I think it's well worth working more on and keeping it in our database. Also wanted to mention that when we started, we knew Texas was politically limited. Fishes are not, right? We've known for a long time that things like the Mexican blind cat and other things are sneaking across the border right under the border fence. You know, they don't give, they don't care about it. And uh, rivers flow into Texas from outside of Texas. So our new area that we've been managing everything for for quite a while now is a total of 11 to 12% of the total area of the 48 contiguous US and it's 10,000 or 10% of the US population lives in our scope. So this is a, a significant project affecting the watersheds that a lot of people live in. Adam's gonna talk about this stuff too. We've got all this documentation behind all these specimens, photos, We've got cool uh, illustrations from Tom O'Leary that people can use. We had a guy come in, take a lot of pictures in Texas. 
in situ out in the rivers. And um, I, I'm leaving this in here too. Adam will talk, I'm sure, a little bit about it. But when you start thinking about all the stuff you can use specimens for, it's extensive. And, and we're still learning what else we can learn from them. So specimens are really important. Like I said, they're books. We're still learning how to read. And then I just wanted to step back and talk about benefits. So the world benefits from this. We've got our data out there now. We've published it all. I'll talk more about FAIR published. FAIR is a system of, of getting data out in machine readable format. It's digitally archived now, so it's not going to go away. It's accessible to the world. Lots of people worldwide are using it without practically even knowing it through things like GBIF and stuff. And it just integrates seamlessly into the world's biodiversity informatics world now. Uh, it basically gives us a foundation on which future researchers can work. It is there permanently. And there's really no telling what all it might be used for in the future. And specifically, I want to talk about how it uh, benefited TPWD. We thought it was pretty significant when uh, they basically accepted our recommendations on how they should revise their Texas Conservation Action Plan. The previous version in 2011 had 62 freshwater species listed in it. We recommended that they list 84 and they took it to their commission. Now this is a board of, gov of governor appointees, right? This is above and beyond TPWD, but because of the sound uh, data behind this proposal, they were able to get the commission to accept a final proposal that accepted all but two or three of these species we recommended. So it really does have an impact in the, the real world. And uh, they use it now in their nature serve processing for status rankings. The nature uh, uh, native fish conservation areas grew out of that, as I mentioned. And all of their all of their users and everybody else in the world now has easy access to all this information through our website. We here in the collections uh, really benefited. We got salary money to really keep our collection working while we were distracted doing all the Fishes of Texas project stuff, which was way above and beyond our own collection. So we could keep our collection functioning at full level. We could hire student assistants. We can pay the, the geeks in tech and whatnot. And it also increases our collections budget because we're going out and doing lots of sampling now and bringing in more specimens than ever before. We're growing at an unprecedented rate. And that's because of this newer project started in 2014, which gets both us UT folks and TPWD folks out in the field together, collecting much more than just fishes and getting the public involved in these bio blitzes. So you can, uh, I'm gonna skip over this too. I should have taken this slide out. Basically, this is uh, the way we run that pro program is using these tools we've developed to find gaps in the data and then decide where this project goes out for samples. Um, Adam will tell you more about that stuff, but this is our history so far. We've got a bunch of reports uh, on TPWD's website. So you can see how we're filling in some blanks here. Every effort includes an effort in one of the NFCAs, and then we go above and beyond that with our sampling, specimen taking, and all that. So it's a really great pro program that gets us out there. And now I want to talk a little bit about the future, where we're going. So we've been doing time travel, right? We've gone way back in time, but um, we've, and we can project with those models into the future. But I talked a little bit about uh, specimens for which we don't have data. Since those uh, initial things where I mentioned we didn't have any specimens of sturgeon, it was pretty clear that they were in the Rio Grande Basin, but no actual specimens. The archaeologists have them, right? So now we do have specimens from the Rio Grande Basin. They're from right about here. And we can probably even get DNA off of those things to see if this was a, a different species of sturgeon than we think it might have been. And then another interesting one is going back into time, both with archaeology and other things we flagged these records as suspect. They came from Harvard. They had minimal data on them. Lo locality descriptions seemed good, so we could map them. Uh, but it just, there was such an outlier. This is our own collections data. And we didn't have these before. These came from these angler databases. These are anglers chasing both in specifically. So they just now provided new records. And that makes these things look much less suspect, right? And uh, basically, the archaeologists also have this pointing out that there was a mission and there was a record of a bowfin in the 1700s from there. So um, in that, that dig, when they did that, they found specimens of bowfin. So all that ties together, more data, better. And I want to hit up back on this fair stuff. A lot of people think of these data as something humans interpreted, interpret. That's not the case anymore. Machines do this. Uh, basically, the data sets are so large, you need to do this with computers. 
and you need to get your data into standard format that way. It needs to be findable. We are now. Uh, we're, anybody can find Fishes of Texas, just Google it, and we're fully integrated in the Global Biodiversity Informatics Facility, IDIG Bio, all these major aggregators. We're totally accessible because we're in Darwin Core format. We're interop interoperable with uh, the global formats, all that sort of stuff. And people can freely utilize our data. We publish it openly, no restrictions except on some of our images so that you don't have to worry about reusing it. So, uh, and then next we're gonna look at getting to that fair idea of interoperability between TPWD and us. Now that we've done it for the world, we realize we can much better facilitate the data flow from TPWD to us. Quick rehash on funding. We've gotten 3.2 million over the years, lion's share from TPWD. And when we look at who's been involved, it's kind of cool. It comes out about 50-50. I was actually, frankly, kind of surprised by that. But the data we've managed to keep on tracking everybody actually demonstrates that. So it's pretty neat. I'm done. Adam's going to take over. And uh, there we go. Let me unshare here. And I'll pull up Adam's files. My name is Adam Cohen. Um, I've been working on the Fish of Texas project since 2006. And I'm going to give you a quick tour of the website, tell you about our data. You can go to the site and register in the top right hand banner up here. I'm logged on currently as myself, which is an admin, but uh, when you go to log in, uh, you can register. Uh, well, you should register and then you can log in. And when you log in, you'll have more uh, powers in, in the website. You can add field notes, add images, comment on records. You can also get updates from us. Uh, basically, just allows you to be a more interactive user with the Fish of Texas project. Um, so this is our homepage. This is where you, where you, where you land when you go to www.fishesoftexas.org. And you'll see we're on the first tab. There's many tabs across the top, and I will discuss each of those. So the website, basically, the aim is to take raw occurrence data and put it in a database, clean it up, and develop research tools. So on the left here, these are, these are supposed to be different museums and their data. And the raw occurrence data that we've been primarily focused on, and always probably will be, are museum specimens. Museum specimens are the highest quality data because, first of all, they go back way in time, but also there's um, a record. So there's a specimen in a jar on a shelf somewhere, and you can always go back and look at that jar. And in that jar often are labels that often are from the original collectors. There's also field notes available at most of these museums. So you can do a lot of error checking and cleaning up the data uh, using those tools. So we've taken all these data together and put them into one single database and we've formatted those data. So for example, things like dates, um, which come in many different formats, we've sat, uh, settled on a single format. And so now you can query the data uh, as, as if it were one database. So uh, taxonomies like that as well. We've synonymized all the species to a single taxonomy. We georeference the records so that you can do spatial type of queries. So that means putting coordinates on them and uh, a radius error. So you can basically understand um, how precise we know where these locations, uh, these collecting locations occurred. Um, we've also gone through and flagged records that we are suspicious of. So if a record isn't a spatial outlier or a temporal outlier, then we can go back and look at that specimen. And we've done that. Uh, we went to many museums, looked at the specimens, looked at the labels and field notes, and tried to correct as many of those um, uh, flagged records as possible. And then we produced the data, and it's available to you on the website. Uh, the data are also available on GBIF and IDIGBio, so you can go um, to these other kind of larger online data providers to get the data. But here we provide, um, in addition to the data, imagery and um, uh, things like field notes, so you can look at the actual raw data when possible. And then we developed some of our own tools, which I'll talk about later. So now I'm going to go through and talk about each of these tabs, info tab. And this is basically our documentation. So you can see at the top, our documentation is needed updates. They're coming. Um, we will be working on that in the near future, but the, it is still valid. We basically moved to a new content management system. And when that happened, we've uh, we realized we need to make some corrections to our documentation. 
But for example, you can go in here and explore data documentation. I'll just show you a couple of things. Data documentation, data processing, and you can see, um, for example, how we've dealt with scientific names and how we've come to the, some of the uh, decisions we've come to about what to call certain species. We've went through and justify it, uh, justify some of those decisions based on the literature. You can also um, go in and look at uh, some of our institutions, like who has provided data to us, and you can learn where they're located, who to contact at these places. Uh, we highly recommend that when you use our data, you credit the original source, which includes these places here. So these are museums all over the world, mostly in the United States. And this list is growing as we add more data to the, to the database. Also, if you need to contact us, you can do that. You can find that information here. We highly encourage people to contact us with questions or if they have data they want to share. Uh, best way is probably via email. There's a link to do that there. Another thing that people often like are frequently asked questions. So if you have a question, you might be able to find your question there where it's already been answered. But I encourage users to explore this area and uh, we will be continually working on it to improve it. So this is our data tab. This is where you come to query the database to extract data uh, for your purposes. Um, you can also get our data on GBIF and IDIGBIO, which are online global data providers. Uh, there's more fields provided on those providers than we provide via our website. So it might be more useful for some people, depending on what kind of data you want to get, to go get the data from there directly. So you can come to the data tab and make queries based on any number of criteria that we have here. You can query by genus and species if you have a taxonomic query. By institution, this is the donor institution, the, the institution contributing the data to the project. The catalog number, since most of our specimens, most of our records are based on specimens, so they have a catalog number. Collecting event ID is a number that we've generated. It basically coalesces, we coalesce all the records into events. So uh, all the different species uh, from one event can be seen if you know the event ID. We won't often know that. But if you do know that, uh, you can use it to, to see the records from that single event. Collected by, so that's the collector who collected these. Between what begin year and what end year are you interested in pulling data from? Verbatim field contains, this uh, refers to our verbatim data. So we preserve the verbatim data as we've received it from our donors. So you can query that data directly. If you know a string that you're interested in, creek name or collector, you can query uh, the verbatim data. You can look at um, records with photos, records with field notes, and you can also establish, establish how many records you want to pull up in the query per page. Um, and then on this column, on the right here are the uh, geographic types of query criteria. So these apply to records for which we have coordinates. Um, so you can look at by county, you can look at ecoregions, uh, USGS, HUC, uh, that's the hydrologic units. Uh, so by major basin and then within those, the USGS has divided them into um, smaller units. You can query those here, we have HUC 8s. Uh, native fish conservation areas. So this is Parks and Wildlife's uh, more recent effort at uh, conservation. They divided the state up into these conservation areas. Um, largely based on Fish of Texas data. Uh, locality contains, so you can search all the locality in Fish of Texas for particular strings. And you can also pull up records that are within a certain uh, geographic error threshold. So I'm just going to make a query to, to, to get this started and we'll look for hubs. Hubs is considered by some to be the father of Texas ichthyology, and there are lots of records in the database collected by him. And let's say 100 records per page. And let's just see hubs records with photos and field notes. And then push submit. And then the data are available. 72 records and the institutions that provide the data are listed too. In this case, they're all the records that meet the criteria are from the Texas Natural History Collections. But usually 
or depending on your query, there'll be more uh, data providers. You can, if you're registered and logged in, you can download CSV and KML to use the data for your own purposes. You can map it, um, do what you will with it. And then there's the list of records. And since these records have images, there's a picture, a thumbnail of those images. I'm gonna tell you about the color coding on these later when I talk about the map tab. It's a better place to discuss that. But you can see all the records we have, color codes with images. And each one of these is a hyperlink to the specimen page. So I'm just gonna click on one of these so we can look at it. This is an interesting one because it's Gambusia georgii, which is thought to be extinct. Clicking on that, open a new, new tab. And then you see one of our specimen pages. And on the right, notice our verbatim donor data. This is the data as we've received it from the donor untouched. And then on the left is our interpretation of the data. So this record is TNHC, which stands for Texas Natural History Collection. That's the donor institution's codon. In that case, that's us, Texas Natural History Collections. And um, this is the catalog number. And then the data below that are the data that refer to this, this specimen, or this jar of specimens. And you'll notice that we've made changes from the verbatim data. Um, offhand, you'll notice Chromac is spelled differently here and here. We've determined that C Hubs is Clark Hubs. We changed July, uh, July 21st to July 22nd. And that's coming in part from the field notes. So uh, a lot of our records have field notes. And I will go ahead and open that so you can see. Here are Clark Hudson's field notes, field notes from that event. And often field notes will have information about the habitat, the time of collection, the weather, the list of the species, things they saw. Um, really it can hold almost any information that's relevant to that collecting event. In this case, you can see we could use some of this data to help us correct the spellings and the dates on that record. So going back to the, the specimen page for this record. So, so there's the field notes. You can also use this hyperlink to uh, go see all the occurrences, the species, the other jars on the shelf associated with this collecting event. So I mentioned that we had uh, conglomerated all the uh, records into events. So all the records that share the same event ID can be had by clicking on this link. I'll do that now. And if you go down, there's the event ID for this record. And you can see there are 12 jars that were collected at the same time and place. Continuing down, if you're logged in, you can upload field notes and you can upload locality photos and specimen images. So that's one of the things that only registered users can do is add that kind of content. Going down, you see decisions about how we make the determination. In this case, we didn't actually examine the specimen, but if we do, there will be information about our examination notes if we have them. There's information about how we georeference the record. There's information about how many specimens are in the jar here. And there is information about um, the geography. So if this, this, this record has been georeferenced, we were able to extract uh, a lot of geographic information, uh, including hub information, equal region, county. Uh, this is our locality description translated from the verbatim and then we've assigned coordinates and error. So if you look at the record, um, you can look at different views of the record here. Terrain view. Is that not working? That doesn't seem to be working at the moment. There we go. Oh, it didn't have, we don't have terrain views of that with that zoom level. Um, but you can see there's a point on the river and then there's the error, a, a circle around that point defined by a radius of 318.5 of, of meters. 
Um, and then you can see images associated with the specimen if we have them. In this case, we have quite a few. Um, in this case, they are provided by Brian Wanderhans, uh, who took these images of the Donopodium for us. And at the bottom of the page is a comment form. So we utilize this feature quite a bit. If you ever have a comment, uh, if you find a mistake or want to add something to the database or have any information about this record, you can go ahead and put that here and it will serve as a permanent record um, to let people know what you think about this record. Uh, whenever we're going to make updates to the database or look at specimens, we always refer back to these comments. So it's very useful for us for you to put comments there. So the map tab is where you can go to spatially explore the georeferenced records. Um, the default view is Micropterus treculi, Guadalupe bass, which is our state fish of Texas, but you can select any species you're interested in just using these drop down menus here. We have this color coding system, and you've probably noticed it elsewhere in the website on the checklists, for example, and um, specimen pages. Basically, cool colors indicate those records that we are not suspicious of. So we think they're collected at a time and place that is um, to be expected. Um, warm colors are those records that are collected at a time and place that we are suspicious of. And then superimposed on top of that warm cold system, we have our examination status. So whether we've examined the specimen, intend to, or have not examined it and have no intention of examining it. Uh, so you can see on the periphery of this species' range, uh, we have some suspect records. Often suspect records are on the periphery of the range. Here's an example of a red record. So this is a, a record that we are suspicious of and we've examined it. So we've examined and looked at the specimen and think it, it actually is a Guadalupe bass. Um, so we are very suspicious of this. Something perhaps is wrong with the locality. We just don't know but we are suspicious of it still. Um, some of these suspect records we would like to examine and we have not yet, or at least uh, we have not updated, updated the Fish of the Texas database with that data yet. Um, all the rest of the range is mostly cool. I think there's one temporal outlier here, um, but most of these records we just accept and they're blue. Some of these we've actually examined, which are green. So you can um, zoom around here and explore these data, but I'll jump to our drop-down list here. And this is um, overlays or map overlays. So you can, you can go to Google Street View or the Terrain View, whichever you prefer. We have a default hydrologic layer, which is streams and rivers. Most people prefer it to be on, so it's default. You can look at county shapes. You can look at USGS HUC shapes at various levels. So we have HUC 12, 10, 8, and 6. 6. You can look at major river basins, native fish conservation areas, uh, national hydrographic data set. These are just basically all the water bodies in the state. Also, native range, and this is something that we developed. Um, we developed it at the HUC 8 level, so we don't necessarily think the species occurs in the entirety of these HUC 8s, but we shaded HUC 8s as units. So, um, take, so just as long as we understand that. Um, some areas of this native range are shaded a lighter color. Those are areas that we think they might be native from, but we are, are not saying that for sure. So we have these two different uh, levels of confidence. Darker areas, we're more confident in calling it a native area. So you can explore the data by simply scrolling over the points. And what you'll notice right away is that they are different sizes. So the size of the dot does not represent the spatial error, which we've also have. So we have an error radius. Uh, but this view of the data is simply the number of records at this location. So at this location, we have nine occurrences. And on the right in that blue box, you can see they're listed below. Uh, smaller dots have fewer. And this is a single record. And 
when we have an image, you can see that it's displayed there as well. So you can zoom into these areas and see the details of where these points occur, how many points, and then you can scroll over them. But if you click on them, you get a list of the records that make up that, that dot. So here are four occurrences, this dot, two of them we've examined, two we haven't, but we think they're all reasonably uh, reliable records. And you can click on these, open them up and go to the uh, specimen page. So in this specimen page here, we have field notes. You can go explore the data in great depth if you're curious. And that covers our map tab. Our taxonomy tab is where you can go to explore the taxonomy. Um, the taxonomy is based on the American Fishery Society list of species for um, North America, uh, but we've added more, um, mostly for uh, non-native species that have been introduced to, uh, to our area. Uh, but there's two ways to go to do this. Uh, first is you can go to our browser taxonomy tree where you click on higher level taxa uh, and get an expandable menu of lower level taxa. And just quickly going through an example here. Uh, let's see. So for like um, and then you can just eventually get down to the species level where you can see um, a specimen or a species page. So there's one. I'll show you a different example in a second. Um, here's the other way to get to a, a species page is you can just start by typing taxonome. Okay, and then you get all the lipomas and select one and you're to the species page for lipomas humilis. And here they all start with a photograph at the top and then other photographs a little further down. You can submit a photo if you have one for the species, um, if you are logged in. And then on the top right here is um, a, a, a video showing the progression of collections of the species over time. So starting from the 1800s for most species and then going to modern times. You can see how the fish of Texas has grown over those, um, those years. One of the use, more useful links in the uh, species pages are these browse all records of the species. So if you click on that, you get, uh, it opens a query and query for the species so you can get the results for all the records we have of that species. And you can see for this one we have from many different institutions um, 679 records and you can go explore these. Back to the, spec the species page and you can see uh, taxonomic information here and then below that is the um, species account produced by Tim Bonner at Texas State University. Um, that information from his species accounts are uh, copied below, but you can also go see his original versions. We preserved his website verbatim here. So if you wanna see that, you can, some people are very familiar with this site and we're hosting it on Fish of Texas server right now. So, but they're also here and going down to the bottom there is a place for you to put comments. So if you have a comment about this particular species or have information or digital photographs that you would like to submit to us, you can write all that kind of stuff there and um, it will eventually get incorporated in the website or we'll address it in some way or another. So we've developed checklists. It turns out a lot of our users want to know what species occur in a given area. Um, the default view is the checklist for the state of Texas, but we have um, other checklists for counties, native fish conservation areas, major river basins, and sub-basins. I'll click on one of these just to show you an example. Here's the checklist for the Brazos River. Notice it tells you you're looking at a Brazos River, Brazos River checklist here. 214 species. And what we've done is just simply provide a list of all the species um, for which we have occurrence records falling in the Brazos River Basin. And 
with that, the justification for their current occurring on the list. So we've indicated how many non-suspect non records we have and how many suspect records we have for each species. So scrolling down, you can see um, some of this. And ideally for um, a species to have high confidence of occurring within a checklist, you would like to see a lot of records and preferably records that have been examined. So here's an example of a species that has high confidence of being on the checklist. 17 records we've examined, 33 additional records that have not been examined. But this species almost certainly occurs in the Brazos. Other species are less so. So here's one, Aramizon claviformis. It's known from only three records, one of which is suspect. We have examined one of them, so that helps. Um, other records, like Moxostoma strinum, we have three records that we've examined, um, and we believe they're, sus they're still suspicious. Other, record, other records, like uh, Carpiotes velifer, we think are suspicious. We haven't gotten to examine the specimen yet. But when we have species that are on the checklist only based on suspicious records, we've gone through and just made the whole record pink, indicating we don't think this species really occurs here but we wanted to let, let our users know that we do have occurrences of the species for this basin. Um, we've also indicated uh, non-native status for when we have uh, occurrences that don't overlap with what we determined as the native range for the species. Um, so those are listed along here. And it goes on and on and on for every checklist. And we will eventually be adding a download button so you can download the checklist that covers our checklists. Some users will be interested in our models tab. Here you can download and uh, view uh, results from our max int modeling exercises. We have two versions of these and you can explore the documentation about them here. Um, basically these models um, take occurrences held in the Fishes of Texas database as well as environmental parameters and um, produces a continuous probability coverage for each species. So we can view areas of the state where you expect them to occur, even though they have not been collected there yet. Um, you can also download these models. Um, here's an example of one. So I printed out with Lithium uh, There's a redirect notice here currently, but you can see what the models look like. Um, higher probabilities are in red. Lower probabilities are in yellow here. Um, you can also, you can download um, the raw data behind these as well and read about them in, in this documentation section here. The key tab allows users access to the hubs at all key, which is one of the better known keys for Texas fish. Um, we provide a hyperlink here to the University of Texas digital repository um, where users can download a PDF if they prefer that. <clears throat> um, then we also have a digital version of the key where it's hyperlinked from um, couplet to couplet. So for example, uh, if I choose Centrarca Day, I can go through each of the couplets until I come up with a species determination. Then I can right click on that and open it. Um, <clears throat> and get to the Fishes of Texas uh, species page. So this is the doc search tab of Fishes of Texas project. And here you can go to uh, search our archives of PDFs. Uh, at the moment, we have 429 copies of uh, Parks and Wildlife's Dingle Johnson federal aid project reports, uh, which are mostly from the 50s through the 70s. And um, you can search for um, any term you're interested in here, but we've basically applied NAC natural language algorithms to these to aid in your text searches. So if you look for um, a genus, in this case, Anguilla, um, it'll come up with some results. And you can further refine the search by putting um, place names or human names, um, Brazos here, and it comes up with a result. Um, and you can open the document and explore the document, see if it has any information that's relevant to you. Um, in this document here is where it says American eel, well, Anguilla rostrata. 
So uh, it's a really useful tool for searching through archives of PDFs. So here's our, our statistics tab. Uh, basically, it's summary data from the database. Um, just pretty straightforward for the most part. Um, but we have also this section below here. These are um, uh, basically dashboards that are built using a program called Tableau, and they allow you to be kind of interactive with the data. Sometimes that interactivity makes these a little bit complicated, and I think we need to write up some more documentation to explain them better. Um, but they're pretty useful. So here's sampling events, which is kind of like a way of thinking about collecting effort. And you can see how that's distributed across these various uh, variables. Likewise, uh, biodiversity. You can see how biodiversity is uh, distributed across uh, variables. And again, some of the um, uh, data type here and HUC8. So you can control, um, your, you kind of filter the data and, and there allows it as the complexity, but also makes them more useful. Data quality effort. So this would be like our, our effort at looking at specimens. You can see how that's distributed across variables. So under data gap tools, experimental is where we have some more experimental kind of dashboards. Um, some of these are a little complicated and I'll attempt to explain them. But um, so this one is species accumulation. Uh, it, it was a heat map. So the heat map is based on the species accumulation curve. So basically um, evaluating species accumulation curves to estimate the total number of species that we expect per subbasin, and then looking at how many species have been collected and comparing those two to see how complete we are basically. So red areas are less complete and blue areas are, are more sampled. Um, more closer to that complete state of sampling. So you can see, for example, here's um, a HUC where we uh, estimate uh, 74 to 64 species, um, but we have 66. So we're pretty, we feel like we're pretty close to completion on that. Others, here's one where we only have 37 species out of an estimated 63 to 102. The, the estimated numbers are uh, variable just because we've done this with a couple different models. Um, so these have been pretty useful uh, for just looking at where areas of the state that should be sampled that we need more data. This temporal accumulation chart shows how species have been added to a basin or sub-basin while at the same time showing the collecting effort. So you can kind of see how with effort we gain species over time. You can explore the raw data below as well. These trend analyses uh, were developed by uh, some statisticians at UT. Uh, they're essentially a way of just looking how uh, species, any particular species might be doing over time, like how prevalent it is within a HUC over time. So uh, we evaluate them just in terms of um, whole range within a HUC, and you can see if they're on the incline or decline. And also, you can, we're looking at changes in latitude or longitude um, in their distribution over time. Again, very experimental at this point, and we think these need more data to really become useful. We're hoping the track three data will greatly improve them. Gap heat maps. These are super useful for people needing to look for areas that are undersampled. They were developed for the purpose of finding uh, gaps in the fish data. So these are um, organized by basins. So here's the Colorado Basin. You can uh, kind of further filter on dates and um, data types. Uh, but basically these are one, kilom one kilometer square grids. And within those, you can click on a square and see a list of the species that have been collected across all the collecting events from that square. And you can also highlight one or more of those and uh, get a complete list. But if you push enter, um, you get a uh, the raw data behind it. So I can click there and see uh, basically every record that, that contributes to the what we know about that grid itself. 
All right, thank you, Adam and Dean, so much uh, for your presentation. And I know we're, um, we're about at the top of the hour, a minute over actually, but uh, we did have one question that came through the chat. So we'll try to address that real quickly. So this um, done a lot of really cool, have a lot of really cool work, a lot of really cool data. Um, of course, it's focused in Texas. Are you collecting or planning on collecting um, anything outside of the Texas area? Um, I can quickly answer that. We have a history of collecting a lot outside of Texas. I'm still working in Mexico a fair bit. And uh, we welcome anybody's data within our scope of those drainages that intersect Texas. But uh, basically, the TPWD funding is going to continue, us to continue to fund us just to work in Texas. Gotcha. Very cool. <clears throat> All right. Well, I think since we're about at time, we'll go ahead and let people go. But um, of course, feel free to um, find Adam and Dean from the website, which is Texas website. And um, Matt, do you want to say a few closing words? Um, I want to start by saying thank you, Dean, Adam, so much for the presentation. There was obviously a lot in there to unpack. Um, <laughs> And we tried to get fit a lot here into an hour. So thank you for, for being willing to do this for us. Thanks everyone, everyone for attending. Uh, we are recording the webinar, as you can probably see, and we'll make it available on the CCAST YouTube channel within about a week after we edit some things up a little bit. Um, I did drop a link to the CCAST YouTube channel in the chat, so you all should have it. Um, we also dropped in links for the main CCAST uh, homepage or story map in addition to the CCAS dashboard, where we currently have 118 different case studies uh, from across the West and, and beyond. Um, the scope of that is expanding a little bit. We're working on lining up additional webinar speakers. We'll probably take a month or two off for the summer since so many folks are actually able to get out and do field work again, which is really exciting, uh, but we'll be regrouping in the fall with additional CCAS webinars. Um, if you'd like to make sure you receive those invites but are not getting them yet, feel free to reach out to me or Christy and we'll get you on our list as well. I think that's all I had. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for your time. Thank you so much, Dean and Adam, for joining us and hope everyone has a great day and rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you all.